Welcome back, everyone. Well, we recently did a video on Robert the Bruce, and you guys really liked it, and a bunch of people were asking for some more Scottish history. So we're going to dive a little deeper into the Scottish War for Independence. And a uh, while back, we did the video on the Battle of Bannockburn. Many of you have already seen that. Uh, but now, apparently, um, there's actually a full series from History March, and they've made Bannockburn part five of that series. They've got four kind of prequels to it that came out in the last several months. So we're going to work our way through the rest of that series. There's four parts to it. Battle of Dunbar 1296 is what we'll do today. Uh, Battle of Stirling Bridge 1297, Falkirk 1298, and then Loudon Hill, which is the uh, battle you see at the climax of the film. Uh, Outlaw King, which I mentioned in that video about Robert the Bruce. So let's go ahead and dive into the Battle of Dunbar today. Highly recommend you check out History March if you haven't already. They do a fantastic job and they cover a lot of ancient and Roman and uh, other parts of history that a lot of channels don't cover very much. Definitely worth your time. The link is in the description to the original video for the Battle of Dunbar. Let's go ahead and dive in. Alexander III, King of Scots, is dead. Unfortunately, his death has left the ancient Canmore line hanging by a fragile thread. Alexander, in addition to losing his wife in 1275, lost all his children in the 1280s, before tragically dying himself en route to visiting his new young wife, Yolande of Drew, at Kinghorn, in hopes of siring a new heir. The continuance of the Canmore line now hinged on a small girl, the only daughter of Alexander's daughter, Margaret. Margaret had married the King of Norway in 1281, and it was now this three-year-old girl who claimed the throne of Scotland. And imagine had she lived how history might have been different. The, the ties, the much closer ties that may have existed between Scotland in Norway. I mean, there's so many times in history where just little things like timing and who dies when and who lives and who marries who completely change the trajectory of history. Initially, this state of affairs suited Edward Longshanks, the powerful king of England. Margaret would wed Edward's own heir and namesake. The match was even formalized at a summit attended by the Scottish guardians, as well as Edward, his advisors, and representatives from the Norwegian court on November 6th, 1289. The agreement was premised on the assurance that the Scottish realm would remain free in itself, but if Longshanks ultimately hoped for an eventual unification of the realms in the person of his son's heir with the maid, then this hope was dashed with the demise of young Margaret herself en route to Scotland in September of 1290. Edward, however, remained entrenched in the process of selecting a suitable king from the various claimants. So there are two terrible things that can happen to you if you're talking about a kingdom. The second worst thing that can happen is that your monarch is a child or even a baby, which happens multiple times throughout English, British, Scottish, whatever you name it, history, and history in other places too, but especially it seems like England and Scotland have this problem a lot. Um, the, the worst thing, though, that can happen is that they die and there's no immediate natural successor. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's always somebody who's in line, right? But when it's not the child of the previous monarch or clear-cut person who's next in line, that throws everything into chaos because now... It's up for grabs, and it's going to be about who has the most power, who has the most influence, who has the right friends. Ultimately, Edward achieved what he wanted from the whole affair, requiring all prospective candidates to swear homage to him as caretaker of the realm. In turn, Edward chose John Balliol as king over the other main contender, Robert Bruce. John Balliol was enthroned at Schoon Abbey on 30th of November, 1292. 
Now, keep an eye out, uh, and we're going to live stream the uh, King's coronation ceremony, uh, King Charles the Sixth, or Charles the Sixth, Charles the Third, which is coming up here in May, uh, because you're going to see the Scottish representation for that ceremony, the Stone of Schoon, uh, which is also called the Stone of Destiny, and it, it's closely linked with the throne of Scotland. And until I think uh, sometime in the 20th century, it was in London. It's been returned to Scotland, but it will come for the ceremony and they'll have it underneath his coronation chair. It'll be, there's a slot for it right there. The feast of St. Andrew, Scotland's patron saint and protector. King Edward himself pointedly did not attend the ceremony. As arbiter and kingmaker, Edward by demonstration was John's feudal overlord. In short, the King of Scots attended the coronation of English monarchs, but not vice versa. Most importantly for Edward, Balliol had unambiguously sworn fealty to him before leaving for Schoon and at Newcastle on December 26, 1292. The new King of Scots knelt before the King of England as his sworn man. Longshank unashamedly proceeded as he had begun and took every opportunity to humiliate and demonstrate his superior lordship over both the new king and his subjects, reversing legal rulings of the guardians made during the interregnum and even summoning King John himself in October of 1293 to appear before the English parliament to answer the appeal of a Scottish lord. That's like the ultimate demonstration of your power over somebody, right? When you can demand that another king come before you to deal with something that has to do with his own realm, but deal with it in your capital, in front of you, on your demand. I mean, this is just Edward flexing his power and making sure that John Balliol knows who the real boss is. Such humiliations were too much, even for the meek John Balliol, and specifically his leading lords. Indeed, his weakness as king could also be bent to the will of others other than Longshanks. And that's a great point, too. And I, I guess you could use an analogy like in the mafia, right? You know, the, if the boss, if people see weakness, if people see an opportunity, they're going to take advantage of it. So not only in this case is Balliol perceived as weak because he's got a feudal overlord, but by doing that, he shows weakness to the people below him, and they're going to start to look for cracks and look for, look for opportunities to go after him. It's really, it, it's a calculated risk that Edward has taken with this, because on one hand, you want to show your strength and show your power and exert that, uh, that authority, but if you go too far with it, it can backfire on you, and I think that's what happens. Ironically, Edward himself, as Duke of Gascony, had been summoned by his own feudal lord, King Philip of France, to answer for English attacks on French seamen. Now here's the difference with this situation. Uh, Edward is not showing homage to Philip for the Kingdom of England. Like John Balliol is, you know, he, John Balliol is under Edward as a feudal overlord. Edward is over the kingdom of Scotland. In this case, uh, it's Edward. Remember the uh, the Angevin dynasty or the Plantagenets, as we call them today. Uh, they start in France, right? They they start as Anjou. That's why it's called the Angevin dynasty, and they own large parts of France, dukedoms. Uh, so it's on behalf of those parts of the Kingdom of France that they pay homage to the king, not for England itself. Following his refusal, Philip pounced, seizing Edward's lands in May of 1294. Further trouble erupted in Wales in September. Edward had crushed this revolt by May of 1295, but soon discovered that opposition was brewing in Scotland too. By this time, the Scots had elected a council to govern in Balliol's name, and made common cause with Edward's enemy by concluding an alliance with France in October of the same year. So, um, important thing to note here, you see the four bishops, four barons, and four earls in this council. Uh, they're going to become very important because I mentioned in my video uh, about Robert the Bruce how it's those bishops in the aftermath of what will happen between Bruce and Balliol 
It's those bishops who are going to be meeting who are going to throw their weight behind Robert the Bruce that's going to help solidify his claim on the throne of Scotland. Unfortunately for the defiant Scots, King Edward focused his wrath on them, ordering a general muster at Newcastle to assemble by the 1st of March 1296. The Scots Council issued its own call to arms, ordering all free men to assemble at Caddon Lee, just north of Selkirk. Edward advanced on Wark, occupying the castle on the River Tweed, before halting during the Holy Week. In late March, however, the Scots poured over the border into England, ravaging villages on their approach to Carlisle. The Scots, however, were repelled by the defenders led by the Bruce, the Lord of Annandale, and the Earl of Carrick. Failing to take Carlisle, the Earl of Buchan turned his forces to cutting a path of destruction through Northumberland, burning villages and churches, though this failed to draw the wrath of Edward away from his eastern march into Scottish lands. So notice Robert the Bruce. The Bruce family at this point is on the English side. Of course, that's going to change. And as we mentioned in other parts of Scottish history, uh, there's not always a united Scotland, just like we see in England. In England, we very often see these wars erupt between barons. You see a lot of dynastic civil wars happening. There was one in the aftermath of William the Conqueror with some of his grandchildren fighting with each other. You'll see this happen again under Edward II. You'll see it happen with Richard II. Um, and then obviously the Wars of the Roses will be a big example of that. But the same thing happens in Scotland as well. Uh, and if you're ever... If you're ever wondering, if you don't know about the lay of the land here, if we're talking about the highlands versus the lowlands, everything you see here basically on this map from Stirling and Schoon down is going to be the lowlands of Scotland. And then the highlands, there's kind of this natural divide that's right around this area here. And everything up here where you see the mountains, that's the highlands. Edward's anger was directed towards the lucrative town of Berwick on the Tweed. The attack had begun from the sea, but the four leading ships ran aground and were set upon by the furious Scots, the crews cut to pieces, and their vessels fired. This initial success inflamed the confidence of the defenders to the degree of defying Edward in person when he arrived. Berwick had been one of the settlements demanded by Longshanks the previous year, and repeating his order in person was met with the jeers of his enemies, with an English source even writing that one particular brazen defender bared his behind in the presence of Edward. Go and boil your bottom, son of a silly person. There's another Monty Python reference there. Uh, yeah, so you actually see that, right? For all of its faults in terms of being historically accurate in Braveheart, you see a scene where they do that in Braveheart, right? Where the Scots all turn around and moon the English. We've got a source that says that happened. Given such defiance, it may be surprising to learn that Berwick itself was defended only by a feeble wooden palisade. Edward. Which is quite something when you consider its strategic importance and placement on the map, right on the border between Scotland and England. You would think that's the kind of place that would be heavily defended. And you have in England what are called the Marcher Lords, a march being kind of a, a border land. You have the Welsh Marches, which is the border between Wales and England. You have the Scottish Marches, the, the border area between England and, and Scotland. And very often you're going to want a very powerful and very loyal noble family to be a marcher lord. Uh, in this case, I think you have the Percys, uh, who are uh, going to be earls and later dukes of Northumberland, uh, who are going to be uh, the marcher lords in the north. And uh, at one point, you have Harry Hotspur Percy, uh, around 1400, who's going to lead a rebellion against England. But thus led his armored knights in an assault, brushing aside the rotted fortifications and driving the Scots into the narrow streets. In contrast to the usual framing of this event as a wicked act of brutality, the sack of Berwick actually saw Edward merely adhering to the normal code of war when encountering a defiant town. A town or settlement that refused to surrender left itself open to sacking. Yeah, if, if a town surrendered, you, you typically treated it really well. 
if they held out basically for for the annoyance and the time and effort it's causing you to besiege it, you're going to take it out on those people and people understand that. Chivalric practice concerning the garrison was also within the realms of normality, as Edward offered life and limb to the 200-strong garrison in the town's castle, under the command of William, the Lord of Douglas, which was accepted in exchange for Douglas's own surrender. Edward remained in the charred ruins of Berwick for around a month, improving its defenses with a huge ditch some 80 feet wide mm. by 40 feet deep. It was here that he received a firm message of defiance from the King of Scots, with John Balliol formally renouncing his homage and fealty, extorted by Edward's violent pressure. I don't know for sure, but I'm going to guess they might have been writing to each other in French. The language of the English court, I know at this point, is French. Uh, and of course, even English, as it was spoken at that time, would not bear a lot of resemblance to the English we speak today. Dunbar Castle was the next English target. On paper, the castle was already in English hands, as the castle's lord, Patrick, the Earl of March, had sworn fealty to and was loyal to King Edward, even being present with him at Berwick. Despite this, however, it appears that March's wife, the current custodian of Dunbar, switched sides and retained the stronghold for Balliol. Oops. Unfortunately, the men of Dunbar quickly realized that though they may be able to resist a siege, they could not do so for long. Edward had sent John de Warren, Earl of Surrey, north to capture it with a few thousand men. And the Warrens are another very powerful noble family. Dunbar's garrison asked to send word to Balliol to gauge the correct terms of surrender. The King of Scots was encamped some ten miles to the west at Haddington, and instead of meekly offering surrender terms, resolved to fight. Sending so kind of a cool thing here, I'm looking at this just as an aside, if you ever find yourself traveling to the UK, um, we, when we went to the UK last summer, we left London and went up to York. And then from York, we took the LNER, uh, London Northeastern Railroad uh, train from York to Edinburgh. And it actually follows right along this path. You go right through Berwick and you go right up along this exact attack route. And it's a beautiful scenery that you get to see, see the North Sea as you're traveling. I highly recommend it. In word back to Dunbar to resist. King John sent a force to repel Surrey's army under the command of John Common. It's likely that the numbers involved were quite small. The English force under the Earl of Surrey was likely larger, but suffered the disadvantage of being trapped between the two Scottish forces within Dunbar itself and on the hill overlooking them. So I'm guessing what he's doing here is rather than attack the English directly because they're prepared for that, right? They're in place, they're ready. As you get in between the English and Barrack, you threaten Barrack, you uh, threaten to cut off his supply line, and you force what is probably a more powerful English force to come to you, and so you get to set the terms of the engagement. The Scots had arrived to combat Surrey's besieging army on the morning of the 27th of April. Oh. And they formed up on the high ground of Spottismuir. There you go. Near Dune Hill. So you go to high ground, force him to come to you, hope it works. Surprisingly unconcerned with the Scots' decent defensive position, Surrey mirrored the Scottish split by leaving his infantry to maintain the siege of the castle while he attacked common Scots on the hill with his own cavalry. Approaching the Scottish position, it seemed to common that the English were relatively few, possibly even retreating, given that their crossing of the spot burn broke up their lines and its steep gradient obscured their true numbers. In addition, common may have been confident of a successful charge given the impetus of charging downhill. Therefore, Common charged. The charge, though, quickly devolved into a disorganized and piecemeal attack. You had him coming at you. You had another waterway he was going to have to cross and then come uphill. You wait. Let him exhaust himself. Let him get his, his lines disorganized. Don't do that yourself. The Scots suffered from a similar effect 
not realizing the steepness of the gully below them until they were almost on top of it. Gotta know your own. This ground, hesitance man. blunted any chance of an effective charge, and when the English, quickly regaining their composure after fording the spot burn, countercharged, the Scots broke. The casualties appear to have been minimal, though the Scots were routed. A single Scottish knight, Sir Patrick Graham, was killed. Perhaps more significantly, many men were captured, including the Earls of Athol, Menteith and Ross, with their commander, John Comyn, also among their numbers. So, as well as the, the noble captives, most sources agree at least hundreds of Scottish foot soldiers were killed, although the thousands figure is debatable as not all of Balliol's army may have been engaged. So, all of these battles, there's going to be varying numbers, and even in modern battles, sometimes it's really hard to tell exactly how many casualties there were. All told, as many as 100 knights were taken by Surrey, though some managed to escape to Ettrick Forest. The victory was completed when Longshanks himself arrived the next day with the main English army. Dunbar Castle promptly surrendered, as did the castles of Stirling and Roxburgh, without resistance. Later too, Edinburgh fell after just a few days completing the total Scottish defeat. For John de Warren, Earl of Surrey, the victory must have been sweet, having helped to secure a key castle for his king and the capture of over a hundred high-status Scots. Wow. Dunbar appeared to be the seal on King Edward's conquest of Scotland, with control of South and Central Scotland quickly following. And there's a reason why Edward is remembered not only as Longshanks, but also as the Hammer of the Scots. Edward celebrated the feast of St. John the Baptist in Perth, significantly receiving word from his rival king of the latter's submission. On the 10th of July, the ill-starred Balliol was brought before King Edward himself at Montrose, and literally stripped of his authority as king. The royal blazon tore from his tabard, earning his nickname Tomb Tabard. John Balliol was then unceremoniously carted off to the tower, while Edward continued his victory parade. Upon his return south via Perth, the English king had the sacred stone of destiny removed from Schoon Abbey and transferred south, as well as the royal regalia held in Edinburgh. And there you have it. Edward had a special coronation chair made to house the stone that was only returned to Scotland in 1996. And that's the chair uh, that you see to this day. It's modeled on that one. I don't think it's the same one. Okay, so it is the same one. The difference is that this seat above the stone was added much later. Originally, they sat directly on the stone for the coronation. So with the exception, exception of Queen Mary II, who I think was crowned at the same time as her husband, William III, uh, she was crowned on a copy of the chair. Every English monarch going all the way back then to probably Edward II uh, has been crowned on this chair. It's got people's names carved into it and stuff. It's pretty cool. You can see it if you go to Westminster Abbey. Uh, it's typically down near the front, near the tomb of the unknown warrior, uh, behind glass. You can't like walk right up to it or anything. The message was clear. Edward had not only unkinged Balliol, but had effectively unkingdomed Scotland. Now the land of the Scots would be little more than a dependent part of Edward's own kingdom. Edward hammered home this intent by holding a parliament within the husk of Berwick on August the 28th. Here he required all Scottish landowners to swear fealty not to a king of Scots, but to him, the king of England. Edward occupied Berwick for a further three weeks before leaving his new province in the care of his champion at Dunbar, whom he made viceroy. By September of 1296, Edward Longshanks must have felt assured of his iron grip over his latest conquest. So much so that he apparently quipped as he handed over the seal of Scotland to Surrey that a man does good business when he rids himself of a turd. In 
truth. How he, he did his business, that's for sure. So it gives you an idea of the mindset of the king of England, right? And he's, he's done something similar to Wales. He's put Wales down, which Wales was a principality, not a kingdom. But still, he basically thinks that he has owed everything on the Isle of Great Britain. However, not all resistance was crushed, as even then, the embers of rebellion were smoldering in the heart of a young patriot by the name of William Wallace. If you stayed around this far... All right, so we'll be back tomorrow with the next part of this. We'll pick up the story with William Wallace and see where he takes this whole thing. The real history, not the Braveheart history. So thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below, and we will see you again soon.